Welcome to the Rise to the Challenge podcast. Join me today. She's an author, speaker, consultant. It's Fatima Oliver. How are you doing today, Fatima? I'm doing very well. Thank you for having me on, Alex. I appreciate it. Well, thank you so much. We're excited to have you on the show to talk about your Rise to the Challenge. What we like to do with all of our guests first is go right to the beginning. Talk about where you're from and what were you involved in growing up? Yeah. Well, shoot, I wasn't involved in much. We didn't have much. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, growing up, I grew up in, in Las Vegas. We call it Vegas. And um, definitely in um, you know, the more urban areas, as it is mentioned nowadays, uh, back in my day, it was just simply the hood is, is, how, is where I grew up. Um, I grew up with all brothers. I was the only girl and I actually had five brothers and um, I was the only girl. So there was no precious princess. It was a lot of falling in line and um, learning how to be tough, just like them to, to get them to stop picking on me and also to bail them out when people were picking on them. So um, <laughs> it was a lot of outdoor activities. Kids don't do that nowadays. They like to stay indoors and be on their tablets and computers and games. They don't know what it's like to go outside and be locked out <laughs> until your parents want you to come inside. <laughs> so um, that's, that was my upbringing. What was I doing around that time was outside playing and getting to know people and just getting to know the community and um, um, getting extra aunts and, and mothers and grandparents and just the community. That's how uh, my neighborhood, that's how it was. Everybody was your parent. Everybody would tell on you and and if they had to get you in line, then you were in extra trouble if, if your mom found out about it. So um, that's, that's pretty much how um, I grew up. It was, it was tough at times, um, definitely. Um, my mom was a single parent, so there was a lot of frustration that comes with just being a single parent and having to do everything on your own and, and really adamantly working to not have to rely on the government, the system. And so in that, there were many a times where she worked um, double jobs and when there was no car, she would get on her 10 speed and, and ride to the job. And so sometimes we wouldn't see her till late in the evening. And, um, and so uh, my older brother and myself and the rest of us, you know, we, we knew how to be quiet in the house and lock the door and don't tell anybody that we're home alone and manage until she got home. And really that was the regular in my neighborhood. So that is pretty much how I grew up. I grew up in a type of a survival type of atmosphere environment. It's not like, it, it's, it wasn't like the purge where everybody was just mm -hmm. out, you know, after you, nothing like that. But you grew up quicker than you should have. And you had to be tough and sometimes play as an adult in a, you know, as a child take on adult responsibilities. And um, that was unfortunate. It, it definitely wasn't the way that um, my mom desired us to be raised, but that was just the life. That was the way it was. And and so as a grown up or as a young adult, being a young adult, being a youth, being a young adult um, in my thirties, going into my forties, um, I definitely knew how to survive pretty much anything. I feel like I can survive it. Yeah, it may tear me apart, break my heart, all of that but I know that I have the tools to get up and survive it. Unfortunately, because of how um, um, the requirement of surviving in my neighborhood or knowing how to get yourself up and shake it off, we didn't deal with a lot of emotion. And so there was a lot of emotional disconnect that I experienced um, as a youth, as a young adult in my thirties and in my forties, just learning how to be okay with showing emotion and not looking at it as being weak. When you're growing up during these times and you said that you had to grow up quickly, do you think it was hard not being able to have that childhood and being out with friends or something, but you had to basically take care of the household or yeah. be with your brothers in a yeah. way that you couldn't be a child? I'm thinking about it now, uh, I think there are pros and cons to it. Of course, we always, as a, as a parent, of course, I want my children to be children, to stay in that space, to believe that um, everything is innocent, to keep their innocence as long as they can. And so in that, from a parent's perspective, yes, I feel like there was a part of me that was cheated from that because of just how life was at that time. It wasn't necessarily 
um, anything that we could control. Um, at the same time, in that space, it was normal. So pretty much uh, there were a plenty of children, plenty of households that were in similar situations. So it was our normal. It wasn't strange to be um, at home, unfortunately, with, with one parent. It wasn't strange to be um, sometimes at home alone and uh, making meals for your brothers or, you know, or trying to figure out how to cook <laughs> or, or making those three things that your parent taught you how to make. <laughs> that wasn't abnormal. That was just our way of life. I think to, um, to a degree, it made me tougher. It made me um, stronger mentally. So there are some things that you can benefit from having certain responsibilities. In saying that, though, unfortunately, it's it's also those responsibilities that you would not want on an eight year old, a ten year old. You would want those responsibilities to be maybe come alongside when when you're going into your teens, right? Thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, mm -hmm. learning um, how to be more responsibility, uh, more responsible, more self sufficient. And so that's where the unfortunate part is: is that I learned to be, and my brothers, we learned how to be self sufficient at an age where we really should have been able to just rely on our parents. Did the bond between you and your brothers grow over time where you guys were having to do a lot more in the household? Shoot, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a good question. Um, I think that it's one of those things that if one gets a little hot headed now, I can say, boy, look at here. We slept in the same bed. Don't even trip. You know, like I can bring it, bring it down. Let's let's come back to reality of how we grew up, right? Um, but at that day and age, it, you'd be amazed how your regular behavior now, if you have siblings, would be that regular behavior then. Uh, a kid is a kid, right? A kid is going to get into mischievous stuff. We're going to do all the type of stuff while our parents aren't around. We're going to do all those things that you would naturally do regardless of what your environment is. So picking on each other, sneaking in stuff, um, going outside when we shouldn't, uh, cleaning up at the last minute, uh, beating each other up. I mean, all that stuff that you would do now, that my kids would do now, is the same things that we got into at that age. We just had more responsibility attached to it or more, yeah, I would say more responsibility because there was more expectation, uh, you know, and, and I think that could be controversial because some people would say, well, you know, like I even mentioned that it made me more um, independent. It made me more self-sufficient. It made me, um, I think stronger mentally, just as uh, um, it made me more mature. So where I would be in a conversation at 13, my conversation would be more mature than just your regular, maybe 13 year old. And that would have to do with their life experiences. My life experiences were more vast. And so knowing that there are some things that I try to shield my children from now, at the same time, there are some areas where I'm like, boy, at your age, I was doing this, 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 and this, right? <laughs> you know, you're not, you're not quick enough. You're, you know, your, your brain isn't sharp enough. I remember in my day. So uh, maybe that's a generational thing. I, I really think that that was just our culture. It was not unusual to have, um, what is it, latchkey kids? That's what we were called back then. It wasn't unusual to have a key around your neck and folks knew that you let yourself in the house and you didn't open the door. That was, that was normal. Of course, you know, being that way now would be crazy because of how crazy the world is. Mm -hmm. But back then, it you know, the crazies weren't locked up. All the crazies were locked up and we were still doing it. You know, it's just, it was a part of the community. It was a part of the culture. It was just the way that you grew up. A big conversation topic that comes up is the value of the dollar, or the value of the things that you have as a child growing up in the communities that you live in. Yeah. Do you feel that you learned what the value of a dollar is or the things that you had because of the situation and having the single mom that's working hard for everything for you and your brothers? Yeah, I definitely think that that was an imprint. Uh, just seeing her work so hard and just thinking back on that, absolutely. I don't think I knew it right away. I still think I had a child's mind and every child believes that their parents are super parents, right? Um, that what can they not do? 
and um, it took until I was really kind of like 18, 19, kind of starting to branch out on my own where I realized, wow, bills are real, <laughs> <laughs> right? That $50 that she wanted from me when I was staying in her home, that was not a lot of money when I consider that now I have an apartment and I have a power bill and how am I going to pay this, right? Mm. Granted, back in my day, it was like 375 for rent. That is wonderful, okay? I'll but take for, that right now. You know, <laughs> I'll take that. <laughs> but at that time, that was like a lot of money. And so yep, yep. it was a lot for me to give this money to rent and give this money to a power bill. It was just crazy. So the $50 she was asking for when I turned 18 and still living with her, it, you know, high in sight, of course, but it wasn't until I moved. So that's when I really started to understand true value is when I had to do it on my own. And, and then as my life progressed and, you know, as you grow, just thinking back on the sacrifices that she made, it truly did make an imprint on my life. And there were certain things that we did as kids. We, you know, we couldn't afford to, to shop at the regular stores, uh, you know, um, to a great degree. We, we were thrift store kids and um, that's just how it had to be. And I would be embarrassed about that. And I'd be embarrassed about my clothes coming in a brown paper bag and, and having to get starch and, you know, starch them out. And your parent telling you, it doesn't matter where you get your clothes from, you know, they're all the same. But now I tell you, that's the same thing I tell my kids. <laughs> <laughs> that's the same thing I say to my kids. And I have learned how to bend that dollar. And so I'll go to this store and I'll get them Old Navy and I'll get them but I'll sprinkle in some Walmart and I may sprinkle them in some Goodwill, mix it all up all nice. And, and then I sell them the same thing my mom sold me. It doesn't matter where you get your clothes, it doesn't matter how you put it together, you know? But it's true. It's just, um, I really think it has to do with your maturity level and, and really just your age. And I think what kid, there aren't too many kids out there who really understands the value of a dollar unless they've had to sweat for that dollar, right? Yep. So when you start getting your own job, and you start putting in those hours and you start paying your own way, then you really begin to understand the value. And hopefully you begin to understand the sacrifice that your parents are making for you. I think nowadays you just see it all over TV where I, I mean, I was just watching a show and people, the kids were like, oh, I want that Gucci. You know, I want that Rolex. And it's like, right. I, like you said, I'm fine going to Walmart and buying yeah. clothes because to me, it's comfortable. I look nice in it and right. it does what it needs to do. And I think when I was growing up, I had divorced parents, but I was living with my mom and she felt like she was a single mom doing everything for me. And I think I learned at a young age, the value of a dollar. And today, even I'm like, okay, prioritizing what do I want to buy I have that budget list and yeah. I always have the conversation after I go to the grocery store with my mom and I'm like I just spent this amount she goes but you are working for it. and I go but it's a lot and but I know how to stretch I think that's the food network in me like how to stretch out one item for three different things but yeah. I think that's a topic that I think kids need to learn and I, I think do they're too. not learning and yeah yeah I definitely think that needs to be in school. I know back in the day when when I was in school, they had um, home, what was it, home ec? Yeah, it was home, like ec. home ec. Right, and they went through those type of things. They didn't go great, 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 great detail, but they did deal with balancing checkbook and just all of those basics about how to write out a check. I mean, we really was graded on that. Where do you put, where do you sign? What do you, where do you put the money? Where do you write out the money? They don't do that. Now, at least not, not my son. I haven't seen it. And, and he gets a great allowance. I mean, he's, he gets a great allowance. And every time I tell him, we, you need to save, you need to, you know, save this amount of money. I want you to not go under this amount. And I'm telling you at night when I swear he thinks that I'm asleep, I see um, Amazon hit my phone saying that this amount of money has been spent on this debit card. And it's like, <laughs> I thought we had a plan, right? I thought we had a plan, but you're right. Kids aren't, they're just more privileged. You know, they're just more privileged in a space where they don't even realize it. Um, even as a middle-class um, family, there's more privilege, I believe, than it, than it was back 
when, when, you know, when I was growing up and that's good, that's progression, right? But I do think that there's something to be said with still in the midst of that progression, understanding that every penny is earned yeah. and that somebody has sweated for this, you know, and I really, I believe we do a pretty decent job in my home, me and my husband in expressing that to the kids and helping them to understand that we work for this, you know, we, we, you know, we go to work and this is hard earned money. These lights is hard earned, you know, everything that you get is hard earned. Um, my son wanted something. I bought them computers cause they needed computers a, about a month ago. And he asked for something. He asked for, I don't know, maybe like McDonald's or something. I said, you better go eat that computer and act like it's McDonald's. <laughs> I'm just like, that was a lot of money. You don't understand how much, how, you know, how much money that was that I spent, but that was my hard earned money. You better be, don't ask me for nothing, nothing, <laughs> nothing. Okay. Uh, but just really trying to help them to understand that every single thing that they get, somebody paid for that. Somebody earned that money. Somebody went to work sometimes at a job that you don't like and, you know, and kept their mouth shut and, and, have earned, you know, just the the money that they're getting to spend on you and to show gratitude. I'm really a huge proponent on gratitude. You know, I'm I'm big on them saying thank you to each other, um, thank you to us for sure, and and just to anybody that does something for them. I don't ever want them to get beside themselves in regards to showing gratitude. And I think you're doing the right thing because I think when they get older, they're going to thank you and be grateful the things that you taught them because they're going to be in that same shoes and going through the same situation. And they're going to remember the skills and the things that you taught them early. And then they're going to pass it on to the future. When you were growing up, did you have any inspirations or someone that motivated you to follow your dreams, follow your path or the things that you wanted to do? I would say, oof, I mean, definitely it was a conversation around the home that you can do whatever you want to do. I think that um, with the fact that we were working so hard to just survive our environment and um, survive, um, have enough food in the house. I mean, mm -hmm. really, to, um, there are times where my mom went hungry so that we could eat. And so when when you're in that type of a state, sometimes your dreams are not priority. And that's unfortunate, but it's true. As far as somebody helping to build up your dreams. Um, and I believe that part was, that ball was dropped in my upbringing. And so I didn't dream on much. I always thought about though, being a writer and writing. And I used to be in journalism and I even had um, an article, um, uh, published in our local newspaper because Ronald Reagan responded to a letter that I sent to him while he was in office. And, um, and so there was this kind of unspoken understanding that I would one day go into journalism or I would be a lawyer, one or the other, because I talk so much, or I like <laughs> to write one or the other. And um, I wound up not doing either. But, um, and, and, I, and I went into high school and in high school, I was a part of the telecommunications into a trade school and did a little bit of anchoring and learned how to work a camera and all those type of things. So it definitely stayed, I stayed in that niche of journalism and news and features and all of that. And um, eventually I wound up in that sort of industry where I was in, um, I was a background singer for a group called the Righteous Brothers for uh, four or four and a half years. And so eventually, you know, I was in that space somewhat, but I never really got into um, the writing back into it until until a few years ago when I wrote my book. And so um, it's just amazing how even though it wasn't necessarily talked about on frequently at all, because that really just wasn't the focal point that because it it was still a desire that was inside me it was still a passion that was inside me and it's just amazing to me how it came back so many years later in my life that same passion that i had let go of shoot after high school i let go of and and then it found its way back to me just through journaling and then wound up right back in that space of loving to write and and eventually writing a book and so um, I think that's just uh, a testament that 
you don't necessarily need someone to drive your dreams for you, that if there is a desire and a passion inside of you, and that if you can just work to stay tapped into it, that you can see it work its way out into your life. And it may not be on some big grand scale, but you can still do those things that bring you joy, that bring you fulfillment um, in your life. It's, um, there's a, a word in for it, intrinsic motivation, where you do those things that soothe your soul or do those things that um, even though they tire you out, even though they can stress you out, they can, take, they can exhaust you, you just want to get back up and do it again. And it's because it's fulfilling something deeper inside of you where extrinsic motivation is something that you get a tangible reward from. Like you get your paycheck. That's why you go to work. Right. Mm -hmm. Or a kid would clean his room because they don't want to get in trouble or because they get allowance. Um, but that's the driving force It's something physical that you're going to get like a reward when intrinsic motivation is something that it is a reward, but it's internally it's something that's soul tapping, right? It taps into that soul and into that spirit. And your dreams, your desires, your passions can do that for you. And so um, I'm very grateful that I was able to trip into um, that passion so far into my life um, after so many years had gone by and still be able to pick up a pen and write or a computer and type like I had never lost that that desire, that that burning passion and and be able to um, see it unfold into something that I never thought would happen for me. I never even thought that far, um, but wound up writing a book. So did you follow the path with being a background singer instead of going towards the direction of education or a different career path? Well, really, it was one of a situation where I could always sing or a uh, hum. <laughs> and so, um, I think my mom really focused, focused more on that, you know, my singing. And so I was always in somebody's talent show, you know, doing something um, around the neighborhood. And that was more kind of pushed than than much of anything else there was always um that understanding though that you know fatima you're you know you're smart i wanna i want you to go to college and um but a boy i let a boy derail that because i was so in love alex that i could not bear to leave him and so i wound up not going away to college and i really just gave up the desire to go to college altogether and he was an entertainer he sang um locally he was like a local famous guy um, in Vegas. And so we fell head over heels in love. And then I wound up um, really focusing on my singing ability. And that's really how I wound up going in that direction. It's just doors started to open up for me in that space. And so I would sing around town and, and started to learn that you could actually make money singing around town. And then from there, I was just gigging. And, um, and yeah, and getting plenty of opportunities in that area. So it really, I really didn't feel like I was missing anything. It was like, yeah, this is a different direction. Never saw this coming, but I'm still being successful. So, hey, I'm not missing out on anything. And um, it was not until many years later where I just, after I had a child and was on the road singing, and I just felt that I wasn't that the life wasn't really for me, that I needed to be at home with my child. And just, I wanted that, that nurturing part of me to have its, its way. And I was ready to get off the road. And so um, around that time, one of the lead singers wound up passing away and it opened up the door for me to be able to come back home and just really focus on my family. And, and from there, I picked up where I left off of as far as using my brain. I mean, not to say that you don't when you're singing because there's a lot of um, st strategy that goes into that, but I was able to just get back into the workforce and into the corporate world and begin to see that, you know, education was important and eventually found myself going back down that direction of going into going to college. Something that I, I had always thought about because I had promised my mom that I would do. I just didn't think, didn't know how I would. And, um, and as life would have it, wound up going through a, a bunch of situations that, that led me down the road of what else do you have to lose? Go to school. <laughs> so I wound up going to school. And so another door opened. So I really believe that just in life, 
um, life can give you so many different purposes. It just really depends on what type of season you're in, what what you're going through at that time. And, and in that space and time, you will have a purpose. You will have a direction that there's an opportunity that, that falls before you. And the question is, are you gonna look at that opportunity and walk with it or are you gonna go a different way? I believe there's diff, um, different purposes at different times. And so I'm grateful that I've just been able to, whether it was feeling like I tripped into it, it was an accident or somebody just gave me an opportunity. I was able to find myself going into those different purposes at different times in my life. You talked about how the, your significant other at this time was an entertainer. Did you guys be able to work well together or did maybe he feel that you were rising up and going to be going in a different direction, having that dream path of being a big time singer? That is a good question. <laughs> <laughs> And ooh, the stories. <laughs> I'll keep it short. So uh, we definitely had uh, moments where we were able to work together. For me, he was like a mentor. I mean, hands down, the boy could sing, okay? Um, I mean, he could run circles around anybody. That is one thing that he was able to do. And I really believe that that was his, he had no backup plan. That was his backup plan. Mm -hmm. For me, I came from a corporate world that just had a gift and then the door opened for me and I sang and I made money, but I always had something that I could fall back on. So I never really felt kind of trapped or felt like this is it. So our, our intensity in that space was completely different. Um, so whenever um, I would get opportunities um, where I would see it as, you know, this is for the house, there were, there were times where he saw it as competition, even though we did not sing in any way the same. <laughs> there, were, there were often times where it was, it was competitive. And so um, moments where there was opportunity for us to sing on the same gig and make double the money and bring it in the home, to me, one plus one equals two, like, right? That, that's like a come up, like that's, that's a good hustle. He didn't see it like that. And so sometimes he would give the gig to other people instead of allowing me to come on the gig. And I just never understood that. And it was only until after we had separated and was really going on the lines of divorcing that he admitted that he always viewed me as competition. And I just thought that was the craziest thing. But in his eyes, anybody that could sing and that would get an applause was competition for him. And he had to be number one. And so unfortunately, although we sounded magically together, there was so much strife because of our gifts that we could not make it work. We could not seem to put that aside to just be, you know, like Jay-Z and Beyonce or somebody, you know what I mean? It's like, we couldn't get it together. And that's unfortunately, we were both so young though. I was in my twenties and barely in my thirties. And, um, you know, we were just young and just didn't understand the value of family, I think, and the value of partnership, just so many things that come into a relationship, whether you are um, husband and wife, boyfriend and girlfriend, friendships, um, co-workers, there's got to be a partnership somewhere in there. And we just couldn't get that partnership part down. But he wound up making it as far as going down the path that he wanted to go down and became um successful in his own right and when i was out on the road with the righteous brothers he supported me i think to the level in which that he could without being too you know jealous um you know he supported me as much as he could um but unfortunately i think that competitiveness was always like a wedge between us but great question would you say that ego got in his way than being, because you were doing it more for yourself, but also providing financial support because you yeah. did have a child. And yeah. did you worry that it maybe going in that direction could risk that relationship because you would end up being a single mother and you maybe you didn't want to follow the path that you were go yeah. growing up in? Yeah, I didn't really, I, I thought more of, I want my marriage to work. I don't know if I thought about um, as far as I'll look like my mama or somebody like that, but I just wanted it to work. Like who does it, right? So I just wanted it to work. And so 
definitely we had a rule as far as like when I'd go on the road, how many days that I could stay on the road, no more than 10 days on the road before I'd have to come back. I think I only messed up that or missed that rule one time. And that was because we went to Canada and it was out of my control. It was just a longer trip. But typically our uh, my tours were about 10 days and then I'd, I'd get to come home. For, for about a month and then be able to go back on the road, close to a month and go back on the road. So I was home, but you're absolutely right. There came a time just within me knowing that I was, um, you know, I always viewed myself as a family person. And so I was a wife and I was a mother and I just knew that that part of me, I wasn't really doing. I was trying, but I couldn't be too, you know, I couldn't be everything to everybody. And you know, that bothered me. It bothered me more that I wasn't being there for my son. That bothered me more than it was of not being there for my husband. Cause it was like, come on now. I mean, I'm making some good money and it's for, the, it's for both of us. Right. So come on. <laughs> so, um, and, and ultimately just in relationships, um, there's gotta be some level of trust mm -hmm. and you gotta trust somebody. And I had to trust that he was going to do by, do right by the relationship. I mean, he didn't, but I had to trust him. <laughs> I had to trust him. And so, um, you know, and, and that was his responsibility. Um, so young, I didn't understand that he owned that, that that was not for me to own, right? Um, I knew what I was sacrificing. I knew the hard work that I was putting in. I knew, you know, how badly I was working for, for the family. But as far as the demise of the relationship, there was a piece of me that felt like maybe I could have did this more. Maybe I could have did that more. And that really just took a lot of maturity and growth and, and living, continuing to live on and have other relationships to realize, no, that wasn't your fault. That was his fault. And you own your mess and he has to own his mess. And so my mess was not going out on the road. That wasn't my mess. My mess was being, um, you know, crazy controlling as much as I could because I didn't trust him. And so there was a lot of um, other issues that came to the surface that were there before we got married. We just went ahead and got married anyway. But me being out on the road or me making more money at times or me having a gig and then maybe sometimes he had a gig and I wasn't working and I had to rely solely on him. Those type of situations just highlighted those issues that were already there. And so that's why it's sure important to listen to those signs when you have those signs <laughs> um, of that somebody is not right. It is best to listen because I know for me. I don't want to say I wasted, but I definitely learned some hard lessons um, being with someone uh, for the long term that I knew was not relationship ready. You know, I knew with, I went in with my eyes open, knowing that he was a womanizer, you know, and so then to marry him anyway and then go out on the road. It's like that is just like a platter, <laughs> you know, cheat on me, please. And so. You know, I set it up for him. No, it was not me. It was, I could not control what he did, but still I, I really made it easy. <laughs> so it's just, you know, it's just, you gotta pick wisely. And I definitely did not pick wisely. I picked based on, um, he took, he took time for me and he cared for me in my most um, critical moments of my life where it felt like my life was falling apart and I was in a very tumultuous situation and he came into my life and he could sing and he helped mentor me and groom me and grew my, grew, grew my talent. And I felt that I owed him and to a degree. And so, um, you know, I felt that there was a uh, unpaid debt that I owed him. And there was a part of that. And of course, just loving him, you know, from, and from what I felt love was, and uh, being um, having a broken understanding of what love was, and I loved him from that space, and the fact that I felt indebted to him being there for me in the most horrible moments of my life. And so those two mixed together, it just, you know, that that is just ruined, written all over it. And so it caused me a lot of years. We were together for 12 years, married for nine years, and it was a long time to um, get my head knocked on as far as girlfriend, change your mind <laughs> to make a different decision. That was a lot of years that I walked through before I got it to, and got the strength to say, 
you know, this it's just not worth it. This relationship's not worth it. The 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 talent, the the perks that I've been able to get out of the relationship is not worth it. None of that's worth it. Um, I don't know what my self worth is right now, but I know that it's more than this, and it's time to make a, a different decision. Did you feel moving on and getting to the next stage of your life was a start of a fresh start? But or did you feel that he was always going to be there because he was the father of the child? but you didn't have to be so depending on him. You were able to, this is now my life. Now I can take it where I want to go. Sheesh, no, I felt, well, I felt very fragile and vulnerable and scared because I had been with him since he was, he was my high school sweetheart, but he wasn't in high school. I was. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but he was my high school sweetheart. And so like my first real boyfriend, if you want to say, and um, so I didn't really know how to do life without him. Like I, 18 years old, I'd been with them. And um, from 18 all the way through 31, maybe 32, um, maybe 31, I can't remember. But, um, but that's a long time to be with somebody. Those are impressionable ages. That is, you know, your wild time, right? That is your trying to learn about life and um, getting introduced to the cruelty of life. And just all these different things that you learn around that time. And he was there through those huge pivotal moments in my life. So that was hard walking away and learning how to figure it out with, with a kid. That was, that was, that was very, it was scary. It was, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know what I was doing. It was like, um, I would reference in this moment, baby steps. And so like when you're a baby, how you wobble and eventually your legs get stronger, but I fell a lot and I wound up going from, uh, uh, which he was a physically abused, uh, abusive person, um, a womanizer and physically abusive. I went from that to a emotionally and mentally abusive relationship. And so I didn't know what, what normal was. And even before I got with him, I left a home that was emotionally abusive um, with the potential of sexual abuse because the person that had perpetrated me was continuously coming back into my, coming back into our home. So I felt I was running away to safety and I just ran into some chaotic craziness that I was married to for nine years. And then from there into more chaotic and craziness, I didn't know what love looked like. I didn't know what stability looked like. I didn't know what healthy relationships looked like. And so it took a while for me to get that and to get it right. And it it really took, um, I was with um, my, um, I, don't, I guess I should say ex-fiance for four years and um, before I met my husband. And so even in, meeting my husband and him having a healthier idea of what love is about what relationships should look like. I fought that because it was so different than anything I had experienced before. So it had to be weird. It had to be uncomfortable and it had to be wrong. (laughs) And so I really had to do a complete mind shift, um, really allow myself to unlearn horrible behavior and to try to learn new, healthier ways to be in a relationship. And that was hard. It was tough work, but I had to make a decision. And that was, do I want, um, do I want to continue to live this way? And do I want my husband to leave me? Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so so that was a motivator to learn a better way to do relationships. With each new relationship after the long-term one relationship you were in, do you feel that you were vulnerable where you were only trying to do what's best for you and your son? Or were you able to kind of pick some like signals or red, what is it, red lights or that kind of situation? Or you're just trying to see what was going to get you to the next stage of your life? I feel like I was very skeptical. I was in a skeptical state, like waiting on the next shoe to drop. So even in meeting my husband, I was like, yeah, what's your, what's the catch? Mm -hmm. And I really had a hard time believing that he could want me. And so 
um, my self-worth was just nothing. It was like near nothing. And, and I really was waiting on what the catch was. Even after a year or after two years, I was like, okay, when is, when am I going to see it? <laughs> right. Um, something's, you know, something's wrong with him. Like, when am I going to see that sign to where I can say, okay, now it makes sense. And um, I really didn't see it. And now I don't want you to get the idea, Alex, that he is perfect because he is not in any way, shape or form. He, he, he wears my nerves sometimes, but, but he was definitely an upgrade. And so I just was truly waiting on the shoe to drop and it just never dropped. And so as it did it, you know, while it, while I was still waiting for it to drop, I had to realize that Fatima, why can't you deserve that? You know, and I think the more that I began to realize that it really was me and my my personal outlook on relationships and and value, um, and of course that stems from childhood and and tumultuous experiences and and disappointments and all of that stuff that would come from it. Throw in some daddy issues, all of that, right? It stems from that, but once I was able to see that it really was just my outlook on myself, then I was able to kind of <sighs> relax a bit more and say, okay, I guess we're going to try to make this work, you know? Um, but it, it really took a while. It took a good, at least a good two years before I was like, all right, I'm really going to try to make this work. Um, because I, I was really waiting on him to just leave. I'm waiting and because everybody left, you know, everybody left, no mail, in my life that I loved or that were that should have been close to me had ever stayed in my life. Uh, my father wasn't there, you know, my, my ex-husband, he ran out on me and did all kind of crazy stuff. And, and then my ex-fiance, he was pretty much the same way. And so I didn't have a good record, uh, a record for me and staying. So I was just constantly waiting on him to go. And so realizing that he wasn't going nowhere, it really made me have to reassess and say, why are you still waiting on that to happen? Like, what's really wrong with you? And that's really when I started very, very slow baby steps, just started to see the cracks in my own armor um, and for me to start working on myself. During this time with your child, as he's getting older, was he able to kind of see what was going on or understand what is happening? Or did you kind of keep it very simple and kind of hide some things away from him yeah it was tough to hide so um unfortunately he um saw more than he should have i think at his young age and then um you know us me divorcing his dad and um getting in different relationships he definitely was right there in the mix of it i never stopped to ask him how he felt about it um and for the most part, it appeared anyway that he had good relationships, but he still wanted his dad. Mm. And over time, I learned that it was critical for his father to be in his life. Now, it took me some years to learn that because by the time I left his dad, he was about five, four or five years old. Um, it took until he was 14 for me to clearly get the understanding that he needed his father. And even though that my husband was a good man, um, that he wasn't his dad and that he needed his dad. He wanted his dad and, um, and allowed his dad to be the constant parent in his life. And um, me and his dad, we, you know, we had a very tough breakup, divorce. We never saw eye to eye, eye to eye. There were still, a lot of intimidation and manipulative, manipulative tactics that were tried that kept me from being able to trust him. And so to trust him with my kid, it was like never. But as I matured, I learned that it didn't matter what our relationship was, his relationship with his, his son could be completely different and that I needed to allow room for them to form a relationship. And that was tough because it was humbling. Um, to realize that at that age of his life in that state, that the better parent was his dad, not me. Because no matter what I tried, and no matter what my husband tried, we were not the parents that he wanted. He wanted to be around his dad. And so I had to take some humble pie 
and reach out to his dad and actually, um, you know, invite his dad to, um, to, to parent him, to, to take him in and to parent him. And in that, he finally got an understanding of who his father was, good, bad, ugly, indifferent, but he got to know his dad. And um, some years would go by, um, he stayed with him for about four or five years. And um, his father passed away actually last year. And I'm just so grateful that I was mature enough in that moment to allow him to form a true relationship with his father. And so that I wasn't telling him that his father died and he's like, I don't even know who he is, but that he truly could um, find rest in the fact that he had a relationship with his dad. I think growing up for me, where my parents got divorced at a, when I was a young age and living that kind of separate life, I think my mom was kind of in that where I deserve to have that relationship with my dad and grow up knowing who he was. Yeah. And she was one of those people that she never did anything to hurt that relationship I had with him. They had their own, their issues, um, but they always did what was best for me. And over time, as I was getting older, you kind of understand, okay, now I know who both parents were, but right. I knew that I could do what was best for me. And she was always supportive. And I feel you and my mother were probably similar. You guys were supporting the child and you had that mom instinct in yourselves. Yeah. Talk about, you said that it took some time for you to be able to build that confidence. Looking at yourself now, compared to where you were before, what's the biggest thing you've learned about yourself and what are you excited to do that is best for you? So that's, wow. Um, what have I learned about myself? I think the first thing that came to mind was that I'm resilient. I'm definitely resilient and I'm proud that I can bounce back and that I don't allow anything to crush me to the place where um, I can't find myself again. Mm -hmm. I think that's critical because life can be so cruel. Life can be so <laughs> cruel oh, yeah. and unfair and people can be, those closest to you can be sometimes. And being able to handle disappointment or to mishandle disappointment and, uh, and really just fall on your knees and on your face and just feel like you can't go another day and then somehow find the way to go another day. I'm so grateful that somewhere deep inside of me that I have that grit and that it comes out when I need it to come out. And that I'm able to share that with my children, especially having boys, um, so that they understand the importance of getting back up, you know, and don't allow life to beat you down to the point where you do not get back up. And I'm grateful to be able to be an example of that without hiding my hurt or hiding my sadness or hiding my disappointment or anger. I think it's critical to be transparent with my children to a degree as far as any pain that I feel, any disappointment that I feel, because it helps them to understand that life is not perfect for adults, right? That we still feel those things that they feel now. It's just, we have to figure out a better way to handle it. And so I'm grateful for that. And I'm, I'm proud of myself for that. And I'm definitely excited about how I've been able to take the pains in my life, the tragedies in my life, the things that if I would share it all, that folks are like, I can't believe that you went through that. And that I'm able to continue to acknowledge that I went through some craziness in my life but the pain that's associated with that no longer leads my life, no longer is in control over my life. And that I'm able to um, take that and turn it for good and find purpose. And now that I'm able to help other people and I'm helping people to walk through their own pain, their own hurt, um, being able to come alongside them and work through and process the different events that have happened in their life and the emotional connections and giving them the, the tools, the empowerment to face those emotions head on and work through them in a healthy way 
and have healthy conversations or healthy, um, tough conversations in a healthy way and release the pain that, that has plagued them for so many years. I'm grateful that I'm in a space where for me, it's God or my faith that has led me to this place in my life where all those crazy things that have ha happened in my past that, that let that really controlled my life up until a few years ago, um, that God gave me the strength and the grit and the, the wisdom, the intellect to be able to take that and use it for a greater purpose to heal myself, but also now to be able to help other people to heal in those same areas. And so I'm grateful for that. That is huge coming from the type of life that I had. You know, I, I grew up in a place, just talking it over with you, in a space where dreaming wasn't even an, really an option. It was about getting up uh, and doing it all over again <laughs> um, and nothing more than that. And I've lived so many different lives. I have toured, I have, you know, I have sang all over the place and I have written a book and now I'm in a place where, and I've healed, I have healed in areas where so many people have, haven't dared to look inside themselves. And I have healed from those things. And now I'm in a space where I am teaching other people how to heal. That is huge for me. And it just shows you how good, um, I would say for me, God, or, or your, your, um, you know, the, your, your God can be when you give him all the pieces of your life. Um, how how he can take it and make it beautiful if you just allow him to. With American Idol coming back, I mean they're <laughs> they're doing stuff. Are we going to see you on American Idol one day? I'm too old. <laughs> hey, hey. Age is just a number. Hey. I can't even stay up long enough. Do you hear me? <laughs> I'm I'm like I'm talking I'm talking good trash around. I don't know, 10 in the morning. By the time it hits seven or eight, I'm like, what did I commit to? <laughs> You'll be that no, person that's no. like, um, can we move the audition earlier, please? Right? Oh, you were out morning. lunchtime. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that ship has sailed. Now I'm all about praise and worship at my church. And I'm excited about that to be able to use my gift in that area. And that is good enough for me. It really is. Um, I think right now my purpose is just helping other people to heal. And so I'm doing a lot of virtual events and um, where I come alongside people and we do an event called Crushing the Elephants. And we discuss those big things, those elephants in the room that we tiptoe around in our lives that keep us um, captive, keep us trapped in our own life. Whether it's a situation that happened that we don't want to talk about or whether it's um, an event that's coming up that we dare not, we don't want to do, you know, or um, it's um, a person, it can even be ourselves. And so now, you know, my focus is really helping people to deal with those elephants that they tiptoe around in their own life to find some type of peace and find, um, to reshape the, their atmosphere, you know, in the way that they would like it to operate. It's their life, right? If someone had your book in their hand, what is the biggest thing you are hoping that they get out of reading your book? Yeah, so my, my book, The Prescription is in the Dirt, it is about healing. It's about dealing with that stuff that you have suppressed, whether it's a bad breakup, whether it was a bad parent <laughs> or something you've done to somebody. That's what the dirt is. And that's what the book um it really tackles and so if someone was to um pick up the book and want to read it that is my goal for them that they will see themselves in the different events that i went through the different th events that i share in my book about uh, my life and my dirt and how i have stumbled through and and like a kid wobbled and found my legs and found maturity and peace in these different situations. And I would pray that as they read my life stories, that they would also um, find the strength to look and to deal and to face head on their own dirt, whatever that is, and walk it a baby step approach and find their strength to walk through the process of healing um, just like I did and come out on the other side, just truly blessed from the experience.
basically with everything you've shared, it shows that anyone can rise to the challenge. We all yeah. have that determination and we have to be able to believe in ourselves that we're able to do it. I think people that are struggling and they can reach out to you and be able to show that you've gone through stuff and you are there to help other people go through similar situations or things that maybe you don't have experience, but the tools that you've used, they can utilize that in their daily lives. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's been a journey. And I'm so grateful that the journey is at this place where it's like, I can see all of that. And, um, and like you said, the basic tools, you know, you'd be amazed at how basic tools can be used in so many different facets of your life and being able to share those tools with people for them to be able to rise to the challenges in their own life and face it head on, not run away from it and say, this is my mess and it's my responsibility to clean it up. I didn't make the mess, but it's still my mess. And um, it's my responsibility to change the narrative of my story and to make my life what I want it to be. It's nobody else's responsibility. It's my own and take ownership of that. Absolutely. Looking towards the future, what are you hoping to accomplish personally and professionally in the next couple of years? We all know that we're going through a situation together, but what are you hoping to accomplish? Yeah. I definitely um, want to put out another book. I have some ideas and I really have been journaling about it um, in, in which direction it's gonna go. And so that is definitely something in the near future. And just really to be able to, and that for me that's personal and professionally, but also to expand my influence and um, really be able to um, make a positive name for myself in regards to helping people to heal because that, that really is at the heart of um, the reason why we're talking today is being able to um, let people know that they are not alone and that I once felt that way. I once felt like I wanted to end my life. You know, things were so bad. I felt that I truly wanted to end my life and I had kids. And so I know what it feels like to be so rock bottom. And I know what it feels like to feel like nobody understands. And I know what it feels like to feel truly isolated and alone with my thoughts. And so, um, you know, and, and I want to be able to um, expand my territory, expand my platform to a place where people understand that I am available to help them in every way possible. And if I'm unable to help them, to help them to get the resources to, to guide them and support them um, you know, in, their, in their healing journey, um, but really be able to come alongside um, individuals that have walked a similar path and maybe not so similar, but still have hurt, hurt is hurt, and to, and to come alongside them and support them and to guide them and to instruct them, but also to celebrate their success and not being afraid to face their mess. Are you able to have that open conversation with your son and be able to share the struggles and the challenges you have gone through? And also the same as with your husband now, be able to share the struggles and be, have that open conversation with them? For sure. So one of my main things that um, topics is really being able to have a healthy dialogue and a healthy conversation, whether you are um, someone that has been done wrong and and you are basically holding people feet to the fire or if you have hurt somebody and you need to make amends that it really is the same process um, as far as the conversation and that is really just specifically uh, t talking with that person and being able to name what the situation was and being able to express your feelings and how it impacted your life, damaged you, if you wanna say, what you wish would have happened differently. And, um, and then making a decision on what direction the relationship goes. And I've been able to have um, conversations in regards to my son and our personal relationship, relationship with his father, my um, mental health and, and where I am today in my, in my, um, my pursuit to mental health just all of that in that type of strategic way. And so I'm so grateful that I, I have those tools that I was able to use to have those deep conversations because it truly opened up the door 
to talk about so many different topics and even set a foundation for my son to share some things that I didn't know about him. And even with my husband, honestly, in order for me to have written this book, I definitely had to be open and transparent with him. So, um, so yeah, um, for sure, both, both of them, I've had really um, vulnerable and candid conversations um, using that streamlined approach for both of them, um, just with different conversations. And it has proven to be successful and, and, um, and, and it's proven to have some supportive conversations um, that I've had with both of them. So I'm great, very grateful for that. Something with every interview I do, I always try to take one thing that my guests say and utilize it in my life because I'm definitely no perfect person. There's <laughs> definitely no perfect person out there. But something that caught my ears was you talked about making amends with people. And yeah. definitely the last three, four, five years for me, I always have told myself that grudges are not the best thing in this world because you always should be able to talk about things. And I feel that, and I've definitely have gone through, I had a friend who I valued our friendship for almost going on five years. And there was a time where maybe he didn't want to express the issues we were having. And he kind of just stopped talking. And I'm thinking, okay, I can't live my life with this because I need to know what I did wrong because I want to make things better. Yeah. And I had these conversations with fr other friends that knew this person and my family. And they're like, you might have to be patient. And we went a month without talking and he finally reached out to me out of nowhere. And it started to make amends in a way. And he told me what the issues was. I'm like, you know, I apologize for this and this is not how I wanted. But then when I look at that friendship, it's kind of like, we have to go back to square one in a way, because if this is what caused it, what else could cause something bigger? And mm -hmm. that is a yeah. huge thing that I think if someone took something from this is you got to make things right because we live in the days where anything can happen to someone and we don't want that last word to be a negative thing. We always want it to be a positive. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, but, and, but what you said is key too, being able to um, assess the relationship and saying you've walked through the amendments or you've walked through the forgiveness if, if, some, if you had to forgive somebody. Um, definitely, I, I wouldn't approach a conversation unless I was in a place where I was willing to forgive because then yep. it's just an attack anyway. So, but then beyond that, very good assessment of, well, if it was this thing and depending on what level that thing was and it made this happen, then what if it was something that was bigger? I mean, so yeah. where truly is the level of our relationship? And so actually um, in, a, in, in my um, virtual event that I do, um, the crushing the elephants, I talk about friendship levels and that depending on that friendship level will determine what, how far you go as far as what that amendment looks like. Some people are definitely, definitely worth being uncomfortable for. And making amends with somebody, asking for forgiveness, open up, opening your heart to forgive somebody that has wronged you can feel uncomfortable, can feel like you don't want to do it, but you weigh the relationship. Mm -hmm. How much has that person been there for you? You know, what, what time has been invested? And you weigh that on do they deserve um, me feeling uncomfortable in this space to say, please forgive me, or me feeling uncomfortable and saying, you know what, I'm going to give this another chance. And then there are those relationships where it's just like, we used to be here, but we are so not there anymore. And so I made it right. I admitted my wrong, but whether we become kubaya friends or not, I'm really okay. <laughs> you yeah. know? And, and so that's just the reality of life. Relationships change. There are just different seasons in life. Sometimes folks can be your best friend when you're going through a trauma but maybe consider that they were brought into your life for a season to help you through that trauma. And so now you're in a different place and now you guys gradually fall apart. Nothing happened, it's just you gradually fell apart and that was because their season is over. 
I truly believe in that. I truly believe in seasons with friendships and relationships. And sometimes people are brought into your life for just that season. You know, you need somebody. Maybe you need to laugh. Maybe you need to learn how to laugh. So somebody comes in who's just a jokester, but they teach you how to lighten up. Mm -hmm. And then you go your separate ways, but they were they were cool people. Every time you think about them, you're like, wow, I would not have learned how to be so, you know, kind of, you know, relaxed if it wasn't because of them. So everybody serves a purpose and not everybody is meant to be your BFF, you know. Um, and so that just comes again with life and living and maturity and really, really understanding that there are layers to friendships and understanding which layers these people are on. So that when it comes to amends and forgiveness, you can truly assess and say, am I about to go through all of this for somebody that I just met on um, social media? Mm, yeah. Probably not, <laughs> you know, but yeah, for sure. It's definitely assessing, assessing the situation and humbling yourselves, letting go of that pride and being vulnerable and um, letting go of the fear of what could happen and just being vulnerable and sharing um, giving your giving your pain a voice, um, such as your friend may have done, giving given the his pain a voice, um, but also being able to have that platform of seeing another person's viewpoint, and I, I think all that is critical when you're trying to resolve real, or fix issues within a relationship. You got to come open minded. You got to come in a space where you are willing to forgive, mm -hmm. if it makes sense that you are really willing to forgive. And that is the intent of the conversation. And so, um, and that way, whichever way it goes, you know that your heart was in the right place. You know, It's that phrase that I've heard so many times and you mentioned it. Some friends come for that moment. Some friends are for that season. Some friends last a lifetime. And even those season ones, I know that we, if we were in the same room and it's been a while, we could pick it up right back where we were that yes. during that season. <laughs> yes. Yes. And that's because you didn't lose a friendship, right? Correct. Yeah. You, you didn't. Yeah, nothing it was bad just, happened. It's absolutely. Just absolutely. It just gradually, it, it, you know, served its purpose. And yeah. I think that a lot of times our relationships are like that. They serve their purpose and, if we're able to really understand that, I think it's easier for us to let go when it's time to. Yep. And, um, you know, and sometimes it can be tougher when the relationships are closer. But I really believe if we listen really closely to um, our instinct or our spirit, if we want to say um, our soul, I really think that we get the inkling that the relationship is kind of dwindling. And a lot of times it's just us who don't want to let go. But if we listen and allow it to happen organically, it's less dreadful, you know, it's less painful versus when we fight against it. And I know that that was a huge lesson that I had to learn back in my marriage. And um, and, and I'm so grateful that I learned it. But boy, did, I, did it take a long time for me to learn that. And um, but I don't think there are any mistakes. Um, life is meant to teach you. Mm -hmm. And so I really do live by the mantra that I win or I learn. There is no losing. Yep. I win or I learn. The most horrible situations can teach me and not teach me how to be cruel or teach me how to be bitter, but teach me how to change the pain into purpose or teach me how strong I am that I didn't realize I was as strong as I was or teach me how connected me and my family are. I didn't realize that we were and we loved each other so much, you know, because we fight all the time. And now this thing happened and we're so close. You'd be amazed at what pain can teach you. And it doesn't mean that it's the bad things. It can teach you so much good about your family, about your surroundings, about your circle, um, if you allow it. So I definitely am a believer in I win or I learn. The final question I'll ask you, based on your journey and experience, for someone that's listening to this interview, what tips or advice would you give them to overcome obstacles, accomplish their goals, and rise to the challenge? I'll say qu uh, three quick things. Number one is uh, you have to have a safe place to fall. And so that's kind of what we've talked about later on in the show, as far as your circle and your friends, you got to have a safe place to fall. You got to have a place where you can truly be yourself. You're good, bad, ugly, indifferent, snotty nose, filthy mouth, 
um, I hate this situation happened to me. Oh, I wish they would die. Not really, but I really do wish they would die. Those type of things that you dare not say because, oh my God, it's shameful. You need a space where you can say those things, mm -hmm. not to act it out, but to get it out so that you can begin to think clearly. And not everybody is built for that. So you got to make sure that your safe place is built for that. My safe place wasn't always my husband. There are certain things that I talk about that he truly just don't understand. So I have a therapist for that. <laughs> OK, so your, your safe place sometimes will be your therapist or it can be your hairdresser. I don't know, but you got to find your safe place. Number two is you got to be willing to face the hard truths about your life. Face your mess. Right. Sit in your mess. Get all nice and cozy in the mess and then start cleaning it up. Um, deflecting does nothing. Playing the victim does nothing but waste time. Uh, sabotaging and it sabotages you. It sabotages your growth. It sabotages what you can do with your life, your future, your goals. If you sit in this space of I will never be anything because folks told me that I would never be anything. All these horrible things happen to me and they're prettier than me or they're more talented than me. So that means that I can't do it. All that negative talk is doing nothing but moving you farther away from your goals. So you have to face your mess, face the work that you have to do to get where you want to go and then make a plan to do it. And then lastly, I would say is truly, truly it's the toughest one. But in order to heal any facet of your life, any place within you that needs to be healed, and not everybody needs to do this huge surgery, right? It could just be something at work that somebody got a raise and you didn't get it. And now they're your boss and you can't stand them. And so now you're bitter and you act crazy whenever they tell you to do something. You need to heal that. So in any type of healing process, you got to be open to forgiveness. Mm -hmm. They kind of go hand in hand. You can't hold on to resentment and expect to um, for the pain to be released. In order to release the pain, you got to release the anger, the hurt, the sorrow, the disappointment, the sadness. But all of that, in order for you to release that, you got to let the people off, you know, off, off the hook, right? You yep. got to be able to look at people as people and say, we all do stupid stuff. I've done some stupid stuff. Maybe that was a stupid thing they did, but we're all people and we all make mistakes. And so find a safe place. Face your mess, right? And figure out what you need to do to get to your goals. And be willing to be open to hearing another outlook to, to be able to forgive whatever the situation is. And a lot of times, Alex, it's forgiving ourselves. Mm -hmm. Be willing to forgive yourself for whatever the it thing is. Be willing to forgive yourself so that you can move on and truly focus on where you want to go for your future. Fatima, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show and talking about your rise to the challenge. I enjoyed our conversation and people listening to this will be able to learn so much about what they could take into their daily lives. And we're excited to see what the future looks like for you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I so appreciate it. Thanks for having me on.